OK, the shader architecture is sort of a big thing. That's where I talked about where we have a text file and we can assign material descriptions to things and say, OK, this is brick. So we're going to call it textures, you know, gothic, brick. And then we go through and we do an actual, you know, a text file definition of these are the multiple maps, texture maps, how they're blended, how things are generated, things like that. So we actually shouldn't have called it the shader architecture. We probably should have called it the material stuff, but the way things sort of just like morphed and transmogrified over time, it originally started off as like a shading language and it sort of evolved into a full material type thing. So now it's still called shader, even though it is actually materials. So we can do a lot of special effects with very little work. I mean, a lot of special effects that you see in the world, um, you don't see it as much in this level, unfortunately, are just the result of texture coordinate manipulation. I mean, that, that's it. You, you can, if you scroll, turb, scale, stretch, rotate your texture coordinates, and you do a lot of textures on top of that, it, it gives you a very dynamic feel. Our fire is not some you know, procedural fire or anything like that. It's just like four flame textures that are being scrolled, turbulented, if that's a word, uh, blended, and just sort of like mucked together at different speeds, different directions, and it looks very dynamic, very much like fire. And the nice thing about that is we don't have to upload a texture every single frame. We just do four passes, which in general is probably, for smaller surfaces, going to be far less expensive than uploading textures constantly. And like I said, the descriptions are in a text file. And oh, I wonder, well, I'm not going to attempt fate. I was going to say I could probably drop out and show you a text file. Or you can take the uh, leaked IHV test and look for dot shader files. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, yeah, whatever. Um, but, I mean, like, people haven't. And those dot shader files sort of show what we do. But uh, shader files tell you what kind of sounds are on that. So that's why, I mean, sounds obviously have nothing to do with shading. It's a material type thing. So you can say, okay, if anyone falls onto this, they're going to make metal footsteps. They're going to make brick footsteps, whatever. The editor image, so that you can specify a different thumbnail for the shader within the editor. Uh, it has vertex deformation information because that's going to be constant over the, in, for all your stages that you're going to be rendering, it will be constant how you actually manipulate your vertices. Lighting information, uh, if it's a light emitter, you want to say like what its intensity is and possibly what its color is. Well, no, not the color because we get that from the texture. Uh, miscellaneous other materi material global information, tessellation density, if it's a fog brush you can actually specify how much you want that to tessellate. So you can say fog test 64, so every 64 world units or something like that. Um, and a sort bias for it so that if, well, that, that has to do with our state sorting stuff. Basically, if two things resolve to being identical state and identical in all ways, so it's sort of ambiguous which one's going to be drawn in front of the other, but you actually have a preference that anything of this type material should be drawn in front of this type, you can actually push it a little further and give it a slightly higher priority in the sorting. So each stage, uh, each individual stage when you're rendering can specify the texture map, which is just like a name of a TGA file, or dollar light map, which is sort of the magic name for whatever light map was generated for this, assuming there was one. Where the source of your texture coordinates are, so they can be generated through environment mapping, they can be in generated from the actual texture coordinates for the surface or for your model, or they can be light map coordinates. So light maps are just a stage. So you end up saying your very first stage, map, dollar light map, text chord source, light map texture coordinates or whatever we use as our syntax. And boom, you get a light map there. And then your next stage, you just go off and you say, hey, make it diffuse texture, map diffuse texture, texture chord source, texture coordinates for the world texture coordinates, and blend it with source times DAS. It just magically works. Um, and as an aside, you do not have to go through and specify the uh, a, an explicit shader definition for every single surface in the world since that would be horribly tedious. So we try and do things intelligently and if, if all we find is a TGA, not an actual shader description, we sort of examine what's going on with the underlying surface and try and make our best guess as to what happens and that saves everybody a lot of headache. Then you can also specify independently where your alpha and your color are coming from. They can be identity, so just make it white. Uh, they can come from a waveform. Currently, we have sine waves, square waves, triangle waves. If they want it, we can add sawtooths, things like that. With a waveform, you can specify a base, an amplitude, a phase, and a frequency. They can f come from the client game, client game being the part of the game that executes on your side, responsible for visual presentation. So it may want to do some special effect. The renderer has no concept of special effects. So it'll do a special effect that requires it to send down uh, you know, its own computed colors, and then so look for it from the client game. 
or you can have it generate the colors from diffuse and specular lighting. Or actually, the RG, you'd say RGB gen diffuse lighting, alpha gen specular lighting, since our specular is monochromatic. Uh, we theoretically can also do alpha and color modifiers. So once you generate your alpha and your text, or your alpha and your RGB, you can then say, I want to you know, change it by some sine wave or something. So you can do lighting modulated by a sine wave or something like that. Um, that's more implemented because it's orthogonal, but we don't actually use it because we can't think of any reason why we'd want to. Um, so our texture coordinates can be modified in a ton of different ways. So you can specify it's going to be rotated, and so you can have like a spinning pentagram that sits on top of a piece of brick, and you just go off and say, rotate this at you know, one degree per second or negative one degree per second, and it'll just sit there and start rotating. You can also enable or disable clamping of texture coordinates. You can tell it to scroll, and you give it units per second uh, in both the S direction and the T direction. You can do turbulence, just like we did Quake and Quake 2 water. You can tell it to scale, so that'll stretch it out. You can give an arbitrary transform, actually, of, of a three by two matrix. <clears throat> you can specify a blend function each, each stage. Whoa, that's a mess up. So that's not textured coordinate modifiers, that's stage stuff. But uh, you can specify a blend function at each stage, which you actually just type in the OpenGL blend function names. Depth test, depth mask, Alpha test, including you know, whatnot, greater than zero, less than or equal 128, things like that. So we get this shader definition in, which is in the, sort of this canonical multi-pass definition. We can then sort of examine the underlying hardware, look at its multi-texture capabilities and things like that, and say, OK, we can go through and collapse on this hardware for this. We're currently doing something that's very simple, which is just trying to collapse the first two stages if we see the easy case of a modulate or an add. However, John would like to go through and sort of like algebraically collapse everything you know, the, the whole thing as much as possible, which is kind of a lot of work, um, and I don't think it's actually going to gain much benefit, but hey, he wants to do it, and I'm not going to argue. Um, so let's see. You can also specify for each of the shaders the polygon offset. So when we have a shader defined for a wall mark, all we do is instead of, you know, when in the code saying this is a wall mark, we should make sure that we do polygon offset on it, all we do is we just go off and say uh, within the shader definition, this is what the plasma is going to look like. It's an additive saturate effect. It's going to do this. Oh, yeah, polygon offset this. And then when we just draw the plasma stuff in the world, we just slap triangles there. During the rendering phase, it picks up, oh, this is polygon offset, because that's what its material description states. It just magically works. 